The United States has been living a major health crisis, approaching 1 million overdose deaths over the past 20 years. People of color use and sell drugs at lower rates than white people, and yet they face much more severe consequences of substance use, including death, incarceration, and illness. I'm a social worker and an expert on substance use disorders and health equity. Reflecting over my personal and professional experiences, I grew frustrated with the American healthcare system that treats substance use disorders as an individual problem, despite evidence that social determinants of health, such as poverty and discrimination, play a significant role. I have learned that if we are to truly heal substance use disorders, we must adopt multi-level solutions that integrate a biopsychosocial approach informed by trauma, history, context, social justice, and compassion. I believe that social workers are well poised to lead the way given our training in social justice. I would like to invite you to join us in dialogue through a webinar series sponsored by the Council on Social Work Education and funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Our goal is to get together and reimagine the field of substance use disorder treatment through innovative social work education, practice, and research. Will you join us? Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lily Windsor. I am Associate Dean for Research and Professor of Social Work at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I conduct community-based participatory research to promote health equity in the fields of substance use disorder, infectious disease, and involvement in the criminal legal system. I am honored to be moder moderating the CSWE's webinar series. Um, and I would like to thank uh, CSWE for putting this series together. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, Joseph Bass, Javier Coblera, and uh, Crystal Pegas for assisting in the development and implementation of this series. Today, we have two of my dearest colleagues who have been conducting outstanding social work research on substance use disorders among Latino populations for the past few decades. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Nalini Nagy and Ali Cepeda as our fourth webinar presenters. Dr. Nagy is an associate professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Dr. Nagy's research has emphasized the social etiology and the structural mechanisms, including racism, discrimination, uh, foster psychological distress and substance misuse among Latino immigrant men employed in the informal economy. She has been funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse and published extensively in scientific journals as well as edited two books, one on social work practice with Latinos by Oxford University Press and one on social work practice with transitional migrants uh, by Columbia University Press. Dr. Cepeda is an associate professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Southern California. Her work has focused on the social epidemiology of drug use and the related health risk behaviors that disproportionately affect urban Mexican origin minority populations, including violence, HIV, STI infection risks, and mental health conditions. Uh, Dr. Cepeda's research has also highlighted the unique gendered experiences encountered by females within this cultural context. She is recipient of several grants from the National Institute, uh, Institutes of Health, and she has also published extensively in peer-reviewed journals. Um, Dr. Nagy and Cepeda, welcome again, and thank you for joining us today. Um, before we start, I want to cover a few housekeeping issues. So first, I am the CSWE lead consultant in uh, substance use disorders for the year. So that means that if you have questions on this topic, feel free to email me and I'm happy to point you uh, in the right direction. We have a large audience today. So if during the presentation you have questions and comments, please post them on the chat. We will reserve about 30 minutes at the end for questions and discussion. 
I will be reading the questions and the comments so that doctors Nagy and Cepeda can respond. Um, we may not be able to get to all the questions, but I will try my best. So uh, with no further ado, let's get started. So Dr. Nalini, um, go ahead and please take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Windsor. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slide. All right. Uh, I'd like to first start off by thanking the Council on Social Work Education, particularly Deja Andrews and Crystal Pegas and Dr. Windsor for the invitation. And I also really wanna thank you all for joining us in this conversation. And I really am excited to hear from you and to think through next steps uh, as we talk about research with this really underserved uh, population. In the United States, approximately 11 million people are undocumented and these are our neighbors, people that we go to school with, people who we work with. Uh, and despite the fact that there is research that indicates that this population experiences significant stress, there really continues to be an underdeveloped understanding about the mental health of this population. Overall, uh, there is evidence to indicate that substance use rates among this population are low, but there are subgroups where there may be increased risk of engagement in uh, substance use. And this includes uh, immigrant men who work in the informal economy. Despite that, there still is a lack of research regarding the behavioral health outcomes of within a larger group of undocumented immigrants, subgroups of those that experience significant uh, life and work stressors and may be at some of the highest risk for engagement in substance use and uh, deleterious behavioral health outcomes. And this is significant because as you I'm sure I'll know that undocumented immigrants have some of the lowest rates and access to health services and social services. And even when they do have access to health services and social services, uh, there is significant underutilization of this. So when we're speaking of uh, a population of interest in regards to behavioral health, this is a critical population. And I really think the pandemic has highlighted this even more. So Dr. Cepeda and I will be speaking to you, uh, as Dr. Windsor indicated a little earlier, about our research that has spanned for the past couple of de decades using participatory approaches, mixed methods approaches, ethnographic approaches to really access a group uh, of undocumented immigrant workers that has really been classified by the National Institute of Health as well as other organizations as hard to reach. Hard to reach in the sense that this is a group that has not been represented in national surveys or other types of national surveillance. So it has required a significant amount of sort of on the ground field work uh, but in terms of our sort of uh, methodological principles, I wanted to share the fact that it's really rooted in participatory methods that center the lives of uh, immigrant men as the expert of their lives and really focuses on building trust, rapport, because as you can imagine, and for good reason, uh, there is a significant amount of distrust of research and other authorities among this group. My own work has used mixed methods, which is a combination of quantitative and qualitative methods to really highlight and elucidate the life and work experiences of Latino immigrant day laborers. So I'll be speaking to you a little bit about my work with Latino migrant day laborers and uh, some behavioral health uh, correlates. And then Dr. Cepeda will be talking to you about her cutting edge research with uh, US-based immigrants who were deported to Mexico 
And for some of them, they lived not only a significant amount of time in the United States, but most of their lives. And she'll talk to you a little bit about the implications on their uh, behavior health. And both of us will be talking to you about some innovative art space strategies that we've used that can be used as a community intervention or program. And uh, we're excited to talk a little bit more and hear your thoughts about that and how you may be able to use that in your communities. Latino immigrant day laborers are people that you may have seen at uh, the Home Depot parking lot, for example, uh, soliciting work in uh, public street corners or at paint stores like Kelly Moore. Uh, three fourths of the day labor force is undocumented and experiences poverty. Uh, here you see a picture of a pickup truck that has pulled over at a public street corner and men are surrounding it and negotiating work. So the negotiation for work is a verbal sort of negotiation. It's different than other work contracts that require you to sign it and have like all this sort of legal legalese involved. Uh, work contracts for day laborers are really on the fly and are, uh, as a result, insecure, right? There is no sort of paperwork to document the conditions that were agreed upon. Day laborers experience significant uh, inconsistent work. They stand uh, in these public street corners, whether it's significantly 100 degrees, high humidity, or freezing, or rain, right? Uh, and the conditions of work are often dangerous and unregulated. And as a consequence, there's high rates of workplace injury in these jobs. And there's high rates of workers' rights abuses. For example, one in five day laborers every single month experiences wage theft, meaning they're not paid for work that they have produced for a month, two months, or more. And as you can think through, uh, that has an impact on them economically, but as I will speak to you a little bit more, it also has an impact emotionally. This is a group of men that is of high public health interest as it is a highly mobile population. Uh, it's a population that experiences significant stressors, but like, it's also hard to reach. So to think through interventions and programs requires some outside of the box thinking. My work over the last couple of decades has really focused on elucidating the correlates of mental health and substance use among this group of men, as well as identifying contextual risk and protective factors. It has been informed through this transnational social ecological model that I wanted to show you. Often when we think about immigrants or migrants, uh, we think about their experiences starting once they come to the United States. But I'm here to tell you, immigrants, migrants live their lives in a transnational space often, whether they live it just psychologically or psychologically and physically, right? Their life did not just start when they came to the United States. So we really need to think through pre-migration factors uh, that may have a bearing on their health, as well as obviously post-migration factors and how they all come together. My work has also been informed by structural vulnerability theory, uh, Quesada specifically uh, his work with Latino immigrant day laborers, whereupon yes, individual factors matter, interpersonal factors matter, but those sort of social conditions or psychosocial conditions that day laborers experience in their day-to-day -day life, such as experiences of racial discrimination, stigma, violence victimization, social isolation, seem to be the factors that exacerbate their uh, risk of engaging in deleterious health behavior. So when I first started this work a couple, nearly a couple of decades ago, uh, other than the really notable work of Abel Valenzuela at UCLA, and Dr. Kurt Organista at UC Berkeley, there really wasn't too much about day laborers. So 
I started my work really wanting to learn from day laborers themselves and uh, wanting to really be uh, led through these sort of uh, uh, expert informed lived experiences of day laborers themselves. So I spent nearly a year uh, on day labor corners in Austin, Texas, uh, talking to uh, the different immigrant workers about whatever they felt comfortable with, you know, the day's work that day or their families in their country of origin, just really building that rapport and trust. And through that work, uh, I was able to uh, find that many of the day laborers felt that experiences of being socially isolated, uh, feeling discriminated, and work-related stressors such as wage theft had a major impact on their psychological well-being. And some of the things that boosted their psychological well-being were feeling supported by family, their feelings of religiosity, and the friendships that they uh, garnered at the day labor corner and beyond. As I looked at those factors qualitatively, I wanted to also see whether these relationships were found quantitatively. So what I did is I uh, used these qualitative factors and selected quantitative measures, which I uh, hoped would tap into these sort of qualitative experiences and conducted a survey with 150 uh, day labor men. And what we found was that uh, higher levels of racial discrimination and social isolation did quantitatively uh, uh, and significantly were associated with psychological distress. But we also found some divergent findings where upon sending remittances and religiosity were not significant. So I wanted to, to do another sort of check and we did a member checking, a qualitative member checking uh, focus group where I went back into the field and I said to the day labor men who participated in that and said like, this is what we found quantitatively, what do you think? And that was such a good, you know, really good experience because in those discussions, it became really, really clear that the measures that we had used for religiosity or sending remittances were not valid to the experiences of these men. So the religiosity measure, for example, really tapped into church attendance, but not spirituality. And these men were talking about religiosity as spirituality. Sending remittances, as you see in this quote, it's sending remittances to support family it's emotional. When one feels that they're able to support their family, it feels good. But when one cannot, it feels bad emotionally. And the measure that we had was the single item, essentially, that obviously did not tap into the sort of multifaceted, sort of sophisticated way of thinking through remittances. So I really wanted to show that or, or, or bring this up to you all, because it really highlights the importance of selecting measures that are valid to the experiences of the participants, uh, or else we can come, come up with some of some pretty uh, uh, non-reliable sort of conclusions. I also really became interested in how context matters. And we had this opportunity uh, along with Dr. Cepeda to uh, do some research in New Orleans. And this was right after Katrina hit New Orleans. For those of you uh, that know, uh, at that time, New Orleans or pre-Katrina, New Orleans did not have a significant Latino immigrant population. But once Katrina hit, uh, there was a growing labor force of Latino immigrant men, uh, specifically day laborers, who went to New Orleans to help with the rebuilding uh, and demolition efforts. And there, what we found is that even in the absence of an infrastructure that was not set up for Latino uh, immigrant men, there was a building of camaraderie among the men themselves, but because of the sort of high sort of access to crack, a drug that most of the men that came to New Orleans had previously not used, there was use of initiation of crack. Um, and there were other factors that they felt that led to it, and that included uh, violent victimization, and wage theft, 
um, and experiences of social isolation. So I really became interested in uh, these sort of contextual factors that seem to shape engagement and risk as I, we saw in New Orleans. And I wanted to see if the unique sort of settlement context of Baltimore had, what were some of the sort of factors that emerged from that? And Baltimore, in terms of a new immigrant settlement context, is, uh, a city that is unique to a uh, city, for example, such as Los Angeles or Houston or uh, other cities that have an established group of, uh, of Latinos, right? The city of Baltimore has in the last several decades experienced a significant uh, population loss. But when you look at the Latino population, it's really been on a steep increase. But simultaneously, as it been on a steep increase, there has been uh, the the la even though the infrastructure, social service infrastructure for monolingual Spanish speakers is building, it still has not kept up to the pace of uh, of Latino immigrants that are living in the city and need services. Baltimore, for those of you that may not know, uh, has visible concentrated poverty. Uh, over here on the side, actually, I wanted to show you is that building that you see, that's uh, Johns Hopkins, one of our premier uh, academic institutions. And you see these are boarded up houses. A lot of the Latino immigrants in the city have moved to some of the most uh, disenfranchised neighborhoods. Uh, they've experienced violent victimization and theft, much like in New Orleans, where there's this sort of concept of walking ATMs where uh, men who work as day laborers are often perceived to carry uh, a large amounts of cash after work, uh, but, uh, you know, and they don't trust banking institutions, et cetera, or the police. So they're seen as easy targets for uh, theft. And Baltimore also has high rates of drug use, presence of open air drug markets, and one of the highest prevalence of uh, heroin. So I was really interested in looking at the, the, the drug use uh, of Latino immigrants, uh, especially those who worked as day laborers who came into the city, and looking at the unique contextual features of the settlement experience that led to initiation of use or adverse health behaviors. So we conducted uh, social mapping and recruitment of the two major day labor sites that I'll show you pictures of. We used a culturally grounded interview protocol to qualitatively tap into their experiences in Baltimore City, but also pre-migration. And uh, we interviewed, because I wanted to see differences between those who started using before they came to the US, so pre-migration drug initiators, versus those who started using drugs once they came to the US versus those who never used. I sampled uh, 27 pre-migration drug initiators, 25 post and 25 non-drug users. These were the two major day labor corners that we recruited from. That's the 7-Eleven corner. Uh, for those of you familiar with Baltimore, uh, that's by Fells Point, and this is Home Depot. Majority of our uh, sample was from Mexico, and majority were uh, single in the U.S. And we, uh, as always, analyze our data in the source language Spanish. And for this particular analysis, we looked at the two dimensions of uh, migration and uh, the new settlement. These are, marijuana was the most used drug followed by cocaine. And what the results indicate is what's interesting, um, because of the sampling of pre-migration and post-migration drug users and non-drug users, I was able to see and tap into what were some of the key turning points. Because if you think about it, post-migration drug users came to the US not using drugs, but there was something within this context that led them to initiate drug use, right? So 
this was this allowed us to tease out qualitatively what might have been some key turning points. And for those that were non-drug users, what what were some protective factors that continued to lead to 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 not using? In terms of uh, the use, participants indicated that they used for self-medication. They often used to relax, to be happy, to forget problems. One participant stated, I think it's because of la soledad, la familia. One is alone. I think that's why I began to drink. Another participant stated, I started marijuana when I got here. The truth is that I did not have anyone here. I felt depressed. I was looking for something to make me feel better. Many of the participants actually, post-migration uh, participants, post-migration drug users indicated to us that there was a crisis in their family, a death in their family that first led to initiating use. In terms of, uh, uh, in terms of accessibility, the context of Baltimore, much like the New Orleans context, was indicated to be a context of extreme accessibility of drugs. A 34-year-old a participant from El Salvador said, I was with some friends. They were making those cigarillos, and they gave it to me to try. And there, I smoked it. I tried it simply because of curiosity and for pleasure. So the high levels of accessibility also contributed to use. We also found that in the Latino bars that a lot of the immigrant workers would go to to socialize, uh, these bars were also being targeted for uh, drug selling specifically to the immigrant workers who patronize these bars. So what were some of the differences that we found among non-drug users and those that initiated use once they came to the United States in their 20s, 30s, maybe even 40s? Well, what we found is that those that were non-drug users and continue to be non-drug users, they had more stable attachments in the United States. So they had a spouse in the United States or a really close family member in the United States. Those who started using once they came to the United States, they trended to have uh, a lack of traditional deterrence or, or family members who uh, were authority figures in their lives in the United States or a lack of familial support base. I found this quote really compelling and I wanted to share it with you. Uh, participants stated, this is what someone does because one does not have someone to pull the reins, that, that sort of image of pulling in the reins. If I had a brother or sister in Baltimore, maybe I would listen to their advice, true, but one does not have anyone here. I get into this and I get into the other. I go here and I go there. So this sort of like idea of this, this uh, a familial deterrent is a really critical piece here. In terms of the post-migration drug initiators, in terms of the context, it does seem in terms of a qualitative work that uh, they trend towards more harder drug use versus the pre-migration drug use. So when we asked the participants why that might be, some of the participants indicated that perhaps those who initiated in their country of origin, they initiated drug use in a context where somebody was pulling in the reins, right? But those who initiated drug use here in the United States where no one was pulling in the reins, their level, escalated. So as a participant said, when I come in, if nobody cares that I'm drunk every day, then there's nothing to stop me versus when in my country, uh, if my mother says, hey, maybe you really should stop, then there is something else that is watching over me. In my country, it was another form, as you can see. So what our study in Baltimore really highlighted is that, that the lack of social service infrastructure was a sort of critical piece here in terms of um, creating a situation for many of the men where they feel, felt socially isolated. They felt like they had experiences of uh, significant workers' rights abuses, but there was nowhere for them to turn to 
in terms of authorities or social services, et cetera. So even though the city, Baltimore City is a sanctuary city, they felt like they could not report um, any sort of wage theft or crimes against them to authorities because of, of lack of trust. And that's only increased um, since, since Trump came into the office and it has continued even after he has left the office. We also found that there were a lack of dry activities um, that could allow for these men to build camaraderie. As one of the men said, we could go to the park, we could go to the movies, but those are things that people do when they're with a couple or when we're there with a partner. For us, you know, when I'm walking down the street, another um, compañero might ask me, hey, do you wanna get a drink? Um, but we get a drink, we don't, we don't sit down and talk about our feelings. So really that highlighted about the importance of building social connections that uh, were above and beyond the use of alcohol as a social lubricant. So I do wanna caution you, these are preliminary uh, uh, data points and this is qualitative work that shows some sort of trends, but I think it really indicates through the participants' voices themselves, some of the salient sort of factors that we should really be looking into more um, as we're thinking through substance use and thinking through interventions and community programming with this population. I also want to talk to you a little bit about, um, as I've gone through this work, a lot of my sort of thinking has been you know, how do you make an impact, right? Like what is the sort of public impact? And I'm excited to share with you that I recently uh, concluded a photo voice project where we had six of the Latino immigrant uh, men here in the city who work as day laborers participate uh, using uh, a WhatsApp as a form of daily diary on their phone uh, and using six as prompts about their work, their lives, their coping, their behavior, health, uh, through at least three weeks um, where they took pictures and debriefed with community interviewers about their experiences. But I wanted to talk to you, not about photo voice as a research study per se, but really as a form of empowerment and in a way as an intervention to really think through policy level and community level interventions. What we found is that in these experiences the, of taking pictures and talking about the pictures, the men connected with one another in a way that they hadn't before. And they realized the commonality of their experiences through these pictures. These pictures really became very, very powerful beacons of expressing what they saw in their day-to-day -day lives and really became powerful vehicles to express their stories to people who normally would not see those stories, like policymakers or other types of stakeholders that actually have an influence on city policy. On Saturday, we had our first photo voice exhibition. And some of the pictures that we included in this exhibition included pictures that the men took about their day-to-day -day lives looking for work every day leaving their house in the hope of looking for work, about the workers' rights abuses that they experienced. They talked about how they weren't given bathroom breaks or water breaks or food breaks, of feeling faint or nearly falling to the ground because they felt faint. They talked about the solidarity and the friendships that they sustained with other men that helped them build and live day to day through these difficult work conditions. This is a picture of food that uh, a participant noted that a friend of his made for him that helped him, that made him feel good. But they also talked about coping and how drinking to cope became an important sort of mechanism to deal with these life stressors. And then they also talked about how the lack of sort of basic infrastructure, the social ser service infrastructure, really made them uh, have to call on the heavens for God. Our photo exhibition uh, was one of the first times for many of these men to speak to a large crowd about their experiences, to share their experiences with people who potentially could be involved in larger sort of systemic change. Uh, a critical sort of, this is what I mean in terms of a community intervention, 
was that we saw the building solidarity and the beginnings of action. One of the most sort of affirming situations for me was to see some of our participants who work as day laborers talk to the vice president of community relations at my university or talk to other social service providers about how their services that that organization is providing don't fit the needs of them. And that sort of change, I think, is really critical to um, it's, it's not necessarily measurable, but it's really sort of critical and important to sustain. Um, and it's a challenge for me and other researchers, but I, I'm, I'm interested in, in digging deeper into that. Our next steps are that we're building a stakeholder group comprised of these, uh, these participants who are day laborers, but also behavioral health providers to think through a jointly developed action plan to think through some of the policy action steps. Uh, that we can take uh, with policymakers in Baltimore City. And uh, I'm excited to learn a little bit more about how we can use some of these methods or how you can think through using some of these methods um, in your city itself. And I'll speak to you a little bit more uh, as we get to the Q&A. So thank you to my research team and to the participants that have engaged in the various studies that I've reported to you on today. And um, here is my contact information. I'm going to end my presentation here. And Dr. Cepeda is going to talk to you about her work now. Thank you, Dr. Nagy. Uh, first of all, as well, thank you, Dr. Windsor and CSWE for the invitation um, for me and Nalini to share some of our current work. Uh, let me make sure, let me bring up my, oops, sorry. So what I'm going to do, uh, very similar to Dr. Nagy, except I kind of take, I'm taking a little bit of a different approach in terms of the population that I will be speaking about uh, today. And more than anything, I think when we talk about immigrant groups or we talk about minority populations of uh, persons who use drugs, um, you know, it's hard to sometimes disaggregate. Um, the current study that we are implementing, along with my um, multiple PI, Dr. Abelardo Valdez, is focused on deported Americans and or uh, floating populations, as we like to call them. I'm going to talk a little bit about the overall study, uh, but as uh, Dr. Nagy said, I will focus specifically on one sub subpopulation uh, for, from our larger study. Um, so the, the, pro the purpose of this project is to understand how Mexican and other Latino immigrant populations coming to the U.S or returning to Mexico renders them vulnerable to um, a variety of health risks and stress arising from poverty, discrimination, and cultural differences, just as Dr. Nagy uh, described uh, prior. And the study's objective is to uh, identify the mechanisms by which immigration processes specifically expose individuals to distinct environments, increases susceptibility to risk behaviors and contributes to um, a slew of mental and physical health disparities, including alcohol and drug dependence. Oops. So we take conceptually a migration phases framework and this approach characterizes the multi-staged and cumulative nature of health risks, including substance use, during the entire migration processes. And the phases of the migration uh, framework focus on distinct groups. The travel phase, which is when the person leaves their country of origin uh, to migrate, to the second phase, which is the destination, the third phase is the interception and or apprehension in this case by ICE uh, in the US. And the final phase is the return, which is the phase where the person is returned to their country of origin. For this particular 
project that or study that we are currently embarked in is that we are focused on the destination group. And these are recent Mexican immigrants that are arriving in Los Angeles. And we're also capturing two distinct other types of phases, the interception and the return phase, which includes a sample of recently returned migrants to Mexico City. The target population um, that we're focused on, as I mentioned, are these floating populations, which are recent immigrants within the past five years that have arrived to LA and those who have returned to Mexico City. We are focused on uh, distinct health outcomes, behavioral health outcomes, including infection, physical health, mental health, and substance abuse and dependence. And I won't get into the specifics of our methodology, but we are using a mixed methods approach, which includes um, an EPI survey and ethnographic interviews with a subgroup of participants. We currently have a sample of 253 um, un primarily undocumented immigrants in Los Angeles. And we completed our sample in Mexico City of 307 uh, participants. Um, a couple of special methodological um, considerations is the importance of immigration policy enforcement and COVID burden that had on our sample. Our study began a couple of months before COVID hit. So, um, and it also began uh, when Donald Trump took office. So, uh, in particular for our Los Angeles sample, we, we had some challenges that I can also speak about uh, in, in both sites. I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, just to document and to refresh for those of you who may know this, the history of the US immigration policies, which I will speak about how these have had an impact on the populations uh, of interest. So as you can see here, since 1996, and, and this is just a snapshot, this is by no means all of the immigration policies um, that we could document, but you can see since 1996, there have been some significant changes that many of us may have not been aware of that has contributed to the stigmatization and the deportation of a large group of uh, men and women from the US back to Mexico. So for instance, um, there's been an expansion of a list of deplorable crimes to include misdeme misdemeanors, including drug possession, um, where re-entry was uh, uh, automatic felony, uh, two years of prison. And if the person had a prior record, it's an automatic 10 years prison time. And in 96 as well, judges lost discretionary power to cancel deportations. So, you know, there were mass hearings, there was removal without due process and or judicial review. In 2003, with the Homeland Security and Immigration and Customs Enforcement Act, it basically expanded um, immigration um, and customs enforcement into the interior of the US. It was no longer just focused on, on, on the border uh, states. And it enlisted city and county police to identify unauthorized immigrants and turn them over. And then in the mid 2000s, we see the ability of um, government officials to deport immigrants incarcerated or who had prior convictions. Um, it, again, this included legal permanent resident, residents or, or even those individuals who had completed sentences upon the completion of sentencing, uh, they would be handed over to immigration authorities and depo deported. So what we have is an incarceration and deportation web. Uh, we are seeing that immigration offenses um, are the most common federal crimes, surpassing drug crimes. Uh, although we know that a lot of these are related to drug possession, um, uh, crimes. Uh, it has extended detention experiences and resulted in, in, in the increase of voluntary departure. So when somebody gets um, uh, apprehended, they are asked 
if they are willing to uh, voluntarily uh, return to their country of origin. And so we're seeing uh, lately uh, an increase in this. And, you know, this uh, era mandated those accused of triggering offenses like drug offenses, traffic crimes, be detained for their entire deportation process. So you can see kind of this web of, of factors that have also contributed to such a you know, large increase of deportees. So the deportation carceral system that many individuals are speaking about now includes three things. One, which is the criminalization of immigrants, both funneling them into and removing them from detention in prison, the militarization of the US-Mexico border, and the shift towards the interior enforcement and removing of long-term immigrants. The research, you know, I, I do a lot of, you know, uh, the work out in the field, and this is just an example briefly of there are three planes that arrive into the Mexico City airport on a weekly basis, full of um, young men and women who are being returned uh, either to Mexico City and or bust eventually to the city in which uh, they're, they're, they're uh, originally from. And this is just, I'll play this. So this is a constant occurrence in the Mexico City airport on a weekly basis. So for our study, you know, I wanted to give you a little bit of a overview of our sample. This is again, just uh, we're currently finalizing, you know, a lot of the data cleaning, uh, but I wanted to give you a sample uh, demographics of the US deportees of which I am speaking about. The mean age of our Mexico City sample is approximately 33 years of age, primarily men. And I can speak more about uh, the women in, in this study. Um, most of them are single, although we have a large uh, subgroup of married and or separated and divorced. Uh, the number of times migrated to the US, uh, primarily 60% because many of these uh, men and women left as children. Um, so they, they have been living in the States for a long period of time. Left one or more children behind. This is something that I will speak to uh, again, uh, but this is something that we are finding uh, very disturbing in the sense that a large proportion of the men and women who have been deported have left children, in particular children under the ages of 18. Um, we have over 30% of the sample who report uh, specific mental health uh, conditions, including um, for general health, PTSD, depression, and uh, self-report serious mental illness. Um, we have collected data uh, regarding um, their experiences in detention centers and their experiences while uh, crossing uh, the border as well. Uh, but it gives you a sense of, of the demographics of this uh, population. In terms of substance use, Current substance use, uh, primarily marijuana, is the drug of choice for a lot of these uh, men and women, followed by cocaine and meth. Um, there was some reports of crack, uh, about 9% of the population has reported this. But we see that uh, lifetime use, again, many of these men and women have uh, lived the majority of their lives in the US. Uh, with much higher rates of lifetime use. And again, as Dr. Nagy was speaking about, something that is of concern is the high rates of alcohol use among this population. Um, I draw your attention to, for instance, the frequency of drinking six or more drinks in one sitting. Uh, we got 30% who have done it more than once a month. 
um, and then the almost 27, 28% weekly or monthly. And so this is something that, you know, we we're very focused on in terms of the distinct patterns of use among this uh, population of deportees. I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of the individuals that we're interviewing. And, and as Dr. Nagy did in her presentation, gives you a little bit more insight from the individual's own experiences and in their own words. So a theme that we are finding is the increased um, factor of isolation upon being returned back to Mexico City. So this particular participant uh, was 25 years of age when we interviewed him. Um, he arrived in the U.S. in Indianapolis at three years of age, had been living in the U.S. for 18 years before being deported in 2018. And he talks about the whole deportation and the isolation that he's feeling uh, living in Mexico City now, uh, equivalent to being in a war. He says, it's like a war, same thing here, just like they deported us. It's like they deported us to a war, a war we don't know nothing about. Like me, who grew up in the States all my life, they're going to deport me when I'm an adult, somewhere where I have no idea of, you know, somewhere I don't know how to file my taxes here, I don't know how to get a job or how to get my ID here, nothing. So you're sending me into a war I don't know nothing about. Similarly, you know, we have this individual who was 36 years of age. He arrived when he was 13 years old, had been living in Dallas, Texas for 23 years and was deported in 2019. And I'll play a clip just so you get a, a little bit more of a sense of his uh, experience of the impact his deportation has had on his family. That's it. And, and well, my mom's still sick. She's actually, like, right now, she's really sick. Like, every other weekend, uh, she has to go to the hospital. She's at that point. I recently had another son. Uh, my daughters, my daughters, literally, literally, I had no bullshit. I be and I, I tell my my wife to do it, but she don't do it. My daughters, they cry for me. Daddy, I miss. The other son, they they're sad. They they cry for me. They they I miss you because they they. My wife, she she actually. The times that I've been here, like these five years, she she's been here sometimes. She, she, she comes. Yeah, she yeah. comes. She the first time she was here for a year and eight months. We even, I even had my daughter going to school, but it was an awful experience for her because the kids bullied her. Uh, no, there was no Spanish. Can you imagine? You know? It's come full circle. Right? It, exactly. So the, the what I went through, my kids are going through over here. You know, and 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 having to go on the track to tell you everything, walking like gangies, no tenemos carro, like it, it's bad, it's bad, it's it's just uh, so bad that they don't want to come over here anymore. They, they don't want us. They don't want to come. They want to. They love me. They want to see me. My they, daughter, want they want me over there. They they don't want to be here no more. They they don't they don't want to struggle. So basically, I'm I'm putting them through that. Yeah. You know, and and it's not fair yeah. for them. Yeah. For them as American yeah. family. For them to go, but they don't want to leave me. So what can we do? We keep my wife keeps coming back. I keep having kids, and it's not gonna stop because that was that was my goal. Have seven kids, have a house, company, family, everybody. I'm the provider. Come, you know, I, because whenever we pulled up to the states, they treated us so bad that I, 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 I want to be different. Yeah, yeah. And so as you can hear from, uh, you could surmise, right, that he has a mixed uh, status uh, family uh, back in Dallas. 
His kids are American citizens, uh, including his wife. And just the struggles of, um, even though they can travel back to Mexico City and visit him, um, it's, got, it's become less and less. The final theme I'll speak about is the whole process of adaptation. Um, this particular young man, it was 23 years when we first interviewed him. Um, he arrived in the US at a year and a half uh, of age. He, had, he was just shy of 18. Uh, he had been living in the US when he got deported in 2015 from Phoenix, Arizona. Well, uh, that's, I was scared at first because uh -huh. you know somebody from the States and here in Mexico, that you got money. Yeah. When you come from the states. Yeah. And well, back then people used to look at me and judge me. Like I, as I said, you know, they're like, "Oh, you speak English." And they would look at me, or look at me different. But uh, once I got incarcerated, uh, I started speaking a lot more Spanish than mm -hmm. I did English. And I was like, "I'm keeping keeping it low key." Low. Yeah. That um, I don't let my English out that much. But then at the end. Right before we, we knew that we were going to get out, I was like, I, I speak English, man. I'm like, I'm from the States. I do this, I do that. And, and like that full experience uh, that I had from in there changed. Um, that uh, it didn't matter now that if I was from the States or not. And mm -hmm. now I, I walk the streets and people look at me and they think I'm just another Mexican because mm -hmm. I just speak a lot more Spanish now than I did then than before. Mm -hmm. And and the thing is now I got their legal, you know, they talk a lot, they have an accent and the way they talk. So I started talking like that. So now all the people that they're like, yeah, he's just another Mexican. He probably yeah. learned English in school here or something like yeah. that. And and I mean I feel a little more integrated when I go around around about the streets. Mm -hmm. Um, because I can talk to people, I can ask questions, I can be like, Hola, como estás? Oye, es que no estoy buscando esto. Yeah. O como lo hago para llegar a este autobús? Oh, me dice, no, you gotta go over here to do this, to that. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't, I don't give that same vibe that I did. Like, if you look at me on me, mug you too. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, muchas gracias. I try to be the nicest person that I can. Yeah. And, yeah. And it's, it's, it's crazy because I'm, um, like it's a, it's a lot more different. A lot of people a lot of treat you a lot more a little more differently from mm -hmm. from back from when you first ago. got here. So again, this individual, you know, I I've had the opportunity to interview him uh, when he first got to Mexico City, and I interviewed him multiple times, including after doing at least it was eight months in in the jail in Mexico City for drug possession, um, which he spoke a lot about just kind of the despair he felt uh, a year and a half, a year after being there, losing, not being able to find work. Um, and he started using meth, uh, methamphetamines, and uh, he was arrested and spent time in jail, but the whole process of adapting to this new context. Well, I so, Overall, uh, what we're seeing here is, is kind of a glimpse into a greater understanding of population mobility patterns between the US and Mexico, which you know, gives us some clues in, in kind of the causes and mechanisms of health inequities or advantages among immigrants. Um, we're seeing the kind of the collateral behavioral health consequences on the families that are left behind. Um, the social capital and the workforce in the US that this has had, the impact, uh, the challenges of adapting to a life in Mexico and contributing to untreated disparities in mental health, physical health and substance use. Uh, we know for a fact uh, that a lot of these uh, men and women are not seeking out any kind of uh, services in the city um, and the substance use treatment services that exist um, are primarily out of reach. Uh, there are two extremes in the country in terms of substance use treatment, either the really expensive private and or kind of the more um, uh, unregulated annexos, uh, which make it very difficult for this population. So, in essence, you know, what we are seeing um, from this research is, you know, we're identifying a hard to reach population 
of persons who use drugs and are faced with increasing disparities uh, with very unique vulnerabilities. And we're seeing it in the context of a, of, um, a new global context of population mobility. And I think that's important to understand in terms of you know, the types of populations that you know, as social workers, uh, we may not realize uh, exist. And in particular, you know, the population, the family that is left in the States. Um, many of you who may be doing clinical work may be seeing, uh, you know, the impact, the behavioral uh, problematic uh, uh, factors that the children of these deportees are, are facing. And so that's something, that's an area where we kind of see uh, future research and obviously the impact for clinical practice. Um, and, you know, just to end this part of my presentation, I think, you know, in, you know, we, we're really kind of seeing this, you know, 21st century Mexican diaspora, um, you know, and the consequences of framing a segment of the population of the US population as disposable. And we know, you know, history has many lessons to learn from, uh, from this topic. Um, so I wanna thank my team uh, that has worked feverishly in, in conducting this uh, study in two sites, two binational sites, including our partners in Mexico City, Clinica Especializada Condesa, and the Instituto Ramon de la Fuente Muñiz uh, in Mexico City. Now, I wanted to, you know, Dr. Nagy and Dr. Windsor, you know, ask that we talk, a, I talk a little bit about uh, some of my other research in Mexico City related to um, more of an arts-based approach. And I think Dr. Nagy, you, you mentioned this, but I think this is something that's very important that we start thinking about kind of paradigm shifts in terms of substance use approaches for uh, practice and for research. And just briefly, because I know I'm probably running out of time, but this was an, uh, again, an international research collaboration that emerged um, when we did some prior work in Mexico City related to crack and cocaine use. Um, this was a Bill and Melinda Gates uh, funded uh, Grand Challenges grant uh, that was focused on uh, issues affecting global health. We were a uh, aimed to provide a behavioral nudge to promote HIV health seeking behaviors to crack smoking men and women living in some of the most perilous and hard to access communities. And the approach that we wanted to take was specifically related to this because um, service providers uh, were unable to enter some of these pop some of these communities because of the dangers associated uh, with doing any kind of work in, in, in these. So what we did is, you know, we had a public health education campaign that focused on projection mapping and health promotoras and the distribution of health materials such as HIV, STI testing and crack kits. For those of you who you don't know, uh, projection mapping is an avant-garde form of expression and technology which uses 3D illusions that are projected onto buildings in a community. And so what we did is we mimicked street-based crack street subculture, lifestyle, jargon, everyday life experiences. And they were architecturally mapped uh, using animation and audio messages um, of visual text. And so these are just some uh, examples, right? Which are focused on the education of HIV, um, the paths of crack use, um, using a crack kit, um, and then some of the health implications associated with the use of crack. So for instance, tooth loss uh, um, uh, that was associated primarily with chronic use of crack. These are just some sample projections that were mapped onto that, you know, the buildings that we were doing in these communities. And the idea was that we would do this in an open uh, venue 
so that we were not only targeting uh, crack users themselves, but the entire community uh, themselves uh, um, as well. And this is a time lapse that you can just, uh, I'll play this really quickly and you could see the account, the amount of work that was put into this in terms of uh, the projections. So what we did, you know, the Prometoras, as we were projecting engaged individuals, uh, distributed HIV and other health education materials, we provided referrals, and we distributed safe crack kits. Uh, for those of you who may not know what a safe crack kit, this is what was included in our kits, including Pyrex pipes, uh, rubber mouthpieces, alcohol wipes, condoms, um, uh, lighters, uh, et cetera. We also, more importantly, had a community engagement uh, and a board, which, you know, we needed the community's buy-in and collaboration. And that was not just focused for crack users, because we realized that a lot of the HIV education information and projections that we were doing was also very beneficial to the larger community. Um, and so we do have data, if anybody's interested, we have some published articles that focus on the um, feasibility of providing these behavioral nudges for HIV health seeking behaviors and harm reduction uh, strategies using this particular uh, projection mapping technology. And we feel that it's you know, uh, very conceivable to be able to take this to scale for hard to reach populations with similar substance use patterns and or health risks. I wanna thank my collaborators as well in, in Mexico uh, and in LA. Uh, these, this was our team uh, in Mexico City. And I guess I'll end there. Here is some contact information uh, for myself and I'd be, very happy to speak to anybody um, after this uh, and beyond. Thanks. Wow, this is so exciting. Um, thank you both for such a rich presentation. It is super exciting to be highlighting the uh, undocumented immigrant, uh, immigrant population. They are very close to my heart. And I also really like um, that we are elevating the impact of uh, participatory research, also qualitative methods in the arts, uh, because of the richness of the information that these methods bring and how they center communities and how they give back uh, to these communities as well. So very, very important uh, presentation. For me, uh, there were some really important takeaways. One that really stood out is that uh, social connections are absolutely critical as protective factors, especially among Latino populations. And, um, and, and this is not just uh, reflected in your research here, but in the broader literature. And yet the way that our current immigration policies destroy these social connections, um, and especially through the process of that de de uh, deportation is really striking. Um, I, I, I was, uh, I think photo voice is a wonderful method. And I really like the idea of thinking of it more as uh, intervention as well as the use of the arts. Um, 
And uh, thank you, Dr. Cepeda, for uh, bringing the voices of the participants in the way you did, because I think it really helps humanize uh, the reality that's created by the, the numbers, right, the data. So uh, I think that that was very, very powerful. Um, I would like to encourage now the participants to be posting your questions in the Q&A uh, section of the webinar. Um, in the meantime, uh, we will take a quick break to uh, view the uh, remarks from Dr. Kalavalu uh, Vakalari. Uh, so if you guys could go ahead and uh, play the video, that would be great. Aloha, my name is Halai Valu Vakalahi, President and CEO of the Council on Social Work Education. Thank you for joining us today. Our four-part webinar series on reimagining substance use disorder interventions to reflect social work values is part of our commitment to CSWE's mission to advance excellence and innovation through quality and relevant social work education. We hope that this webinar series will benefit you, your colleagues, students, faculty, and staff, and your community partners. Please take advantage of the continuing education credit available on demand, free of charge. Making this webinar series possible, we want to extend our special thank you to our partners at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, specifically the Opioid State Targeted Response Technical Assistance Grant. Again, thank you for joining us today. Until we meet again, be well. Thank you, CSWE team. Um, so I'm going to get started with the Q&A um, with a question here. And I don't know, CSWE, if you have uh, access to other questions, if you can just post to, uh, to our window. Uh, from Elise Johnson. Um, in my work in an emergency department, I see many undocumented men who, who vulnerable to labor exploitation, use methamphetamines uh, to keep up with the younger colleagues as they are expected to work physically dangerous jobs, 12 hours, uh, days, six days per week. Have you observed this? So in our, uh, and Alice, you can speak to this as well, in our, in our New Orleans study, which uh, once again was conducted post-Katrina, uh, we found that many of the men spoke about initiating and using crack as a way of trying to work many, many hours. They felt like work was pretty plentiful. Uh, and even in the absence of food and other like potable water, drinkable water, crack was available and it allowed them to work more and earn more. So that was also given as a, as a reason for initiating crack use. And I want to, I don't know if you want to add more to that, uh, Dr. Cepeda. Yeah, actually I'll, I'll, I'll just speak to the whole issue of methamphetamines um, because I, that's definitely something we are seeing a really increasing rate of use in Mexico and these are men who have lived all their lives in the US. Uh, and we know that there are now patterns of the use of meth and opioids, you know, so poly substance use and kind of the increasing um, uh, confounding factors that this type of pattern of poly substance use is having on, on ODs, on opioid deaths, on overdose death. Um, we don't know the extent to which uh, I guess, you know, it, it, it has occurred in the country, at least in Mexico, but we know we're seeing that pattern very similar to the US. Um, I do know that similar to what uh, the person that just asked the question has observed, that a lot of the deportees who are using math is related to the fact that many of them are working in, <laughs> ironically, US owned call centers. They're working long, long shifts sitting in front of a computer, working for AT&T, T-Mobile, you know, Best Buy. Um, and so there is uh, reports of a lot of use within these uh, particular call centers. Uh, and a lot of it has to do kind of with, with being able to, to work these long hours uh, and shifts. 
So um, I think what um, Elise asked um, is, is something that we should all be very aware of. Uh, the increasing rates of meth um, uh, in the states uh, that um, could have a lot of uh, implications for our health system. Uh, many people are calling it the next, you know, uh, epidemic. You mentioned briefly, uh, Dr. Cepeda, uh, about treatment, how it can be difficult for this population. I was curious to hear from both of you. Uh, in that context, what is it that they do when uh, migrants, immigrants want to stop using substances? Where do they go? How do they seek treatment? Or if it's not treatment, who do they go for help? Yeah, that was a really interesting point. As I mentioned earlier, we just had our photo voice exhibition on Saturday. And one of the nice, exciting parts of that was that typically you have the people who get the services or you want to get the services and providers, but they typically are not engaged in a conversation together, right? So on Saturday, we saw both providers as well as people who they, you know, immigrant workers who they want to access services from them in the same room. And the conversation from providers was like, we have services available, but for some reason, maybe because of the conditions of their work, Latino immigrant men are not accessing our services. Well, then we had some of our participants raise their hand and say, actually, when, when we have tried to access services, there is, even though you may think it's not a, it's a small amount, but for us paying, you know, $50 or some sort of payment is a lot. And we have to think through, do we want to do that? Or do we want to continue working? They spoke about how AA has been um, helpful because it's a free sort of service. It's a free sort of community, but in cities like Baltimore, AA groups that are just in Spanish, I mean, they exist, but there, there are few groups uh, like that. Uh, overall, there's a lot of challenges in terms of accessing services, uh, not just because of uh, lack of interest, but also because of, you know, money situations, work schedules, et cetera. But I think this is where the outside of the box thinking needs to come in, right? Like there is opportunity, uh, for example, at day labor corners where the men are congregating uh, and are standing there sometimes for hours to do some sort of outreach work. One of the things that came up from that discussion on Saturday was that, you know, the times where immigrant workers feel the most comfortable accessing, accessing services is when somebody as a liaison, like a social service liaison, goes with them to a place and sits with them, uh, which allows them uh, some sort of feeling of comfort in terms of language, but also the sort of cultural broker sort of uh, feeling uh, to access services that they may feel are kind of, you know, inaccessible to them. I'll just add to that. Uh, yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, I didn't speak about our LA uh, based sample, but you know, these are very similar to Dr. Nagy's, which are recent uh, immigrants from Mexico in Los Angeles. And, you know, we're, we're, we're finding and, and there's kind of a correlation uh, in terms of how long they have been in the US and you know rates and 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 variations of substance use but something that's a common denominator is alcohol use um you know they they there's they they live in quarters with like 10 12 men in small apartments um you know they pool their resources and they'll go buy beer and they'll drink at home, right? It's not possible to go out to the bars, especially in, in the LA uh, context, uh, it's just so prohibitively expensive to go out and drink. Um, so we are seeing really you know, high rates of alcohol in that sample. One thing we've noticed in the field is kind of these unregulated, I would say, I guess they're considered AA uh, um, uh, places 
but I, don't, I, I suspect or we suspect that they really are not. Uh, so they're more of what are known as anexos in Mexico, which are uh, kind of unregulated, you know, pirated drug treatment centers that are not implementing any kind of evidence-based substance use protocols uh, or treatment services. And it's, it's more kind of, you know, going sober, sober cold turkey. Um, so that's something that we're further exploring, but you got to remember, you know, that for these immigrant men accessing substance use treatment services, um, is something that is just not feasible given their documentation status. They just, they just feel that it's, you know, it's not, it's not worth, uh, potentially being apprehended and deported. Yes, um, sometime, a long time ago, actually, uh, now, I did some work related to faith-based substance use treatment, and uh, the Latino population seemed to be a really big uh, portion of the, uh, the clients. Um, I was wondering if that would still be the case today, and it's part of what you are referring to unregulated services. But I also know that uh, faith is a very important piece in the Latino community. Can you talk a little bit about the role of uh, churches and faith? Yeah, well, I'll talk about it. Maybe Nalini can talk about it, you know, from the U.S. context. In the Mexico context, especially among those individuals who I would say are more kind of chronic users of hard substances, uh, mandas or promises, right, is kind of their way of dealing with their kind of more problematic use. So they'll they'll do a promise to say, I'm not gonna use in the next month, right? Uh, so that's something that is vocalized a lot, you know, doing una, una manda to one of the patron saints. Um, and number two, um, I, I forgot to mention is that at least in Mexico, you know, being incarcerated, being jailed is kind of the proxy. That's their way uh, as well of, of getting off drugs, at least while they're incarcerated. Uh, but Nalini, maybe you could talk a little bit about the U.S. context. Yeah, you even saw in the pictures that they selected when we asked them about their coping, uh, a prominent coping was God. And participants talked about how God is always there for them. And as I indicated in one of my previous studies, you know, I had tried to look at that quantitatively and we did not uh, find that to be significant. But that's also because I think a lot of measures that look at religiosity tap into church attendance. And for a lot of the immigrant workers here in the United States, especially those that are unattached in the United States to women, who often are the ones that are the ones that facilitate church attendance, they're not attending church, right? So it's more of the sort of spiritual connection, this discussion of God as a as a, as a, as a, as a spiritual force in their lives that is the most relevant in terms of strength and res resilience rather the, than the actual attendance of the church. And I think that's the sort of critical piece there is you know, tapping into that spiritual component as a protective factor, um, but really outside of the bounds of like attending church per se, like, you know, what, what, what that sort of means. Very good. Um, I was curious about um, some of your, uh, I know Dr. Cepeda, you've done work related to gender. Would you be able to share a little bit some of those findings? Yeah, so, I, I mean, that's, I, and, and I have not included them because I, I feel like it doesn't do them justice. I kind of would have to do a whole presentation on just the experience of, of the young women. Um, that in Mexico, we're finding that a, a larger proportion of the women who are returning are returning voluntarily because of um, deaths in the family, uh, because, you know, somebody got sick. Uh, so many of them are returning with their children and their families back to Mexico City. So it's kind of a pseudo voluntary, I would say. Um, uh, we are seeing also in, in LA, the sample of women who we have here 
uh, higher rates of partner violence um, than that that we probably have all heard about. You know, there has been some research on that, but again, it's it's been very difficult. Uh, if you can if you can imagine trying to recruit primarily undocumented women, uh, for them to talk about kind of the abuses that they have had uh, at the hands of, of their partners. Um, and also we are collecting data about the whole travel, the whole travel process. So that, that phase I talked about in terms of our conceptual model. Uh, and we are finding that the women have much higher rates of being exposed to physical violence, emotional, and sexual uh, abuse during the course of, of traveling from their, their, their city of origin to the US. So it's, it's a whole different ball game, I think, for uh, really understanding the implications uh, for, for these uh, women. Um, in terms of substance use, uh, again, for the women in Mexico, in LA, it's, it's alcohol uh, at home, but not to the extent mm -hmm. that we're seeing for the men. Yeah, and, and I also want to underscore the sort of gender related factors are so critical. I alluded to it a little bit in the sending remittances or sending money to support family. Uh, that's a major sort of driving force in a lot of the men that I speak to. And you can imagine there's specific gender, traditional gender norms, right? And in terms of masculine norms, an important masculine norms is being the quote unquote breadwinner. So in, in our samples, what I have found is that uh, being a victim of wage theft or violent victimization of cash the reason that it becomes really emotional is because obviously economically that's that's a major hardship if you're you know if your money is stolen from you but emotionally it becomes larger than that because now you don't have money and they will say this i don't have money as a man to support my family in my country of origin why am i here if I can't support my family in my country of origin, I have no purpose. So then it becomes a deeper sort of uh, crisis where uh, gender norms are really implicated and masculine norms are sort of critical piece to it. Yeah, it, it's a whole family, right? Uh, we need to, con to, to consider the entire context. Um, we are running out of time, so I'm going to um, go ahead and start wrapping up. So thank you again for uh, speaking. Thanks everyone for uh, coming and attending. Um, and we also look forward to seeing you uh, in our next conversation next month on July uh, 19th um, with me and Dr. Alexis Jamal describing community-wise uh, as a social work multi-level substance use disorder intervention. So I hope you guys enjoyed the webinar today and uh, that you have a wonderful evening. Uh, are there any last minute uh, remarks from CSWE before we close? Yes, absolutely. Um, for those of you who are trying to get CEU credit, um, they, it will be available within 24 hours on the Learning Academy where you registered. Um, and you can find your quiz, your webinar, and the survey. Thank okay. you, everyone. Well, uh, thanks, feel free everyone. to contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Yep. All right. Bye. Bye.